Welcome to the African History Podcast, brought to you by African Campfire Stories. Our website is www.africancampfirestories.com. We are available on platforms such as iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. You can search for African Campfire Stories or African History, ACFS. Please help to create more awareness of African history by sharing this podcast with friends. African History Quickies, Episode 10, Ethiopia Defeats Italy, Part 4. This is the fifth and last episode of our Ethiopia Defeats Italy series. The series chronicles the 19th century wars between Ethiopia and Italy. The previous episodes of this series provide the background for the reasons of the wars between these two countries. At the beginning of this series, we stated that we think it's a historical travesty that the Ethiopian military victories over Italy in the 19th centuries are not widely known. And not just because we are an African history podcast, but because during the colonial era in Africa, for an African country to achieve ultimate victory over a European power is simply unheard of. Sure, African nations or tribes did win battles over the Europeans during that era, as exemplified by the Zulu defeat of the British at the Battle of Isandlwana in 1879. However, such military wins by the Africans were usually temporary setbacks for the Europeans. And sometimes these setbacks were very temporary. In the case of the Zulu win against the British in 1879, that win was so temporary that the Zulu king Tlechwayo's forces were defeated soon after. And three years later, in 1882, the Zulu king was taken to England as a prisoner. The Ethiopian victory over the Italians was final. It wouldn't be until the mid-1930s that the Italians returned and overwhelmed the Ethiopians with modern weaponry, including armored vehicles, machine guns, and airplanes. The Italians even used gas on the Ethiopians. But even the Italian victory of the 1930s lasted for only about seven years, and the Ethiopians were back to being independent again. As far as the actual fighting between Ethiopia and Italy, our narrative paused right after the Battle of Dogali in 1887. The Italians were defeated in that battle. We stated that after this defeat, a peace agreement was entered into by the two nations, a peace agreement that we called fake. This fake peace agreement would launch what historians have labeled the First Italo-Ethiopian War of 1895 to 1896. This war is going to be the climax of our Ethiopia Defeats Italy series. Our whole series so far has been leading up to this point. It is called the First Italo-Ethiopian War in order to differentiate it from the Second Italo-Ethiopian War. That is, the aforementioned war that took place in the mid-1930s. We have intentionally began our series decades before the so-called First Italo-Ethiopian War took place. We did so in order to provide you with a full picture of the 19th century conflicts and disagreements between Ethiopia and Italy. We felt that just jumping into the first Italo-Ethiopian war would rob the listeners of the interesting historical events that took place between these two combatants leading up to this final war. It was also important for us to explain where each of the parties was coming from. We hope we have done a decent job in explaining the ideologies of these two countries and their internal politics as these are factors that played a critical role in bringing about the fighting between them. True, as an African history podcast, we have done more towards telling the story of Ethiopia. We have, however, provided a fair amount of background on the situation in Italy as well. Going back to the main narrative, so... Why do we say that the post-battle of Degali peace agreement between Ethiopia and Italy was fake? Well, the answer is simply that uh, history regards that peace agreement, which is known to history as the Treaty of Wuchale, as being duplicitous. 
We have spent a great deal on this series talking about Ethiopian Emperor Menelik II. He was the man that signed the Treaty of Wuchale in May 1889. This was two years after the Ethiopian victory of the Battle of Dogali. The treaty was written in two languages, Italian and Amharic. Most people know what Italian is. Amharic is the working language of Ethiopia and of several states within the federal system of Ethiopia. There are currently over 21 million speakers of Amharic. It is the second most common language in Ethiopia after Oromo. It is also the second most spoken Semitic language in the world after Arabic. The Treaty of Wuchale did not say the same thing in Italian and in Amharic. The Italian language version favored the Italians to the detriment of the Ethiopians, while the Amharic version of the treaty lulled the Ethiopians into thinking the contrary. The Ethiopians could not read Italian and thus could not understand the Italian version of the treaty. We will not explain all the duplicitousness contained in the treaty. However, here are a few examples. The Italian version of the treaty did not give the Ethiopians the significant autonomy that the Amharic version did. The Italian version stated that Ethiopia must conduct its foreign affairs through Italy, thus making Ethiopia into an Italian protectorate. Later in 1889, Italy informed all European governments that Ethiopia was now an Italian protectorate and that all diplomatic relations and communication with Ethiopia had to be conducted via Italy. If anyone wonders why Italy would do this, then, well, this is why we have provided all the background in the previous episodes. Previous episodes will show that the stakes were high for both Italy and Ethiopia. The still young country of Italy just had to make Ethiopia into a colony. Both the educated classes and the lower classes of Italy could not imagine anything less. Meanwhile, Ethiopia, from her point of view, was the great Solomonic Empire defending the Orthodox Christian religion on the Horn of Africa and in the Red Sea region. As far as the Ethiopians were concerned, they were of equal status. They had defended their empire against Islamic armies. In fact, not only were they just contemplating defense, but they were intent on expanding their colonies in Africa. And why not? Their ancestors, the Askumite Empire, had defeated the great Sassanid Persian Empire in the 6th century CE and conquered modern Yemen on the Arabian Peninsula. The ancient Ethiopian Empire used to extend to the other side of the Red Sea. They had done this at the behest of the great Byzantine Roman Empire. At that time, the Byzantines were fighting with Persia and needed help from the Eskumites. It must have thus been important to the Ethiopian sense of heritage that the Byzantine Romans, the founders of the Orthodox Christian religion, had regarded the ancient Ethiopians as fellow brothers. Ethiopia was also the seat of an official and respected Orthodox Christian patriarchy. They had their own unique thousand-year Christian church, with its own Bible written in their own native language. Ethiopians were a proud people. Italy, as we have previously seen, was on a sacred mission of her own, to recreate the Western Roman Empire of Julius Caesar, Augustus, Trajan, and other such Roman greats. So in short, neither Ethiopia nor Italy was going to back down. In 1890, the treaty was revealed to be a ruse. Menelik made international protestations. To defend himself, the Italian ambassador who had signed the treaty on behalf of Italy resorted to racism, claiming that because he was a white man and Menelik was a mere black person, the international community should trust him as to the true nature of the treaty. The discussion on which European countries took which side and why on this argument over the Treaty of Wuchale deserves an entire podcast episode of its own. In short, England, France, Austria, Germany took the side of Italy. The German emperor went as far as writing a reply letter to the Ethiopians, chastising Menelik, telling Menelik that he would take the side of Italian king King Umbreto I, and that Menelik should never, ever address him directly again. Only Russia took the side of Ethiopia. The international arguments are really worth their own separate podcast. 
The racism of these arguments and discussions is shocking for modern times, but was par for the course in the 19th century. Menelik himself, who understood the European racism of their times, used arguments based on racism to get the Russians on his side. In a letter Menelik wrote to the Russians, he stated that the Ethiopians were not like other blacks in Africa who were backwards, uncivilized, and nothing short of baboons. He reminded the Russians that Ethiopia was a civilized and educated country, a country which had converted to Christianity before the European countries who were now ganging up on her. This was also a side swipe to the Russians themselves, who had only converted to Christianity in the 10th century CE, whereas the Ethiopians had converted in the 4th century CE. If anyone is shocked by the Ethiopians talking about their African brother in this way, don't be. It is true that Menelik said what he said because European powers were pressuring him to give in to the Italian demands and he thus desperately needed the Russians to support him. So, desperate times call for desperate language, right? <laughs> But, on the other hand, Menelik did believe what he said to the Russians about other African blacks. We stated earlier in this series that wars between Ethiopia and Italy should not be seen on Ethiopia's part as some sort of pan-African or pro-black struggle. Not at all. This was about pure power politics. The Ethiopians themselves were by this time great colonizers and enslavers of other black Africans. The Ethiopians saw themselves as being colonial equals to the European superpowers. Russia, for her part, supported Ethiopia with weapons and other help, not because she somehow had respect for Africans. Who took which side in this conflict did so purely based on self-interest and their own calculations. Granted, racism did play a part too. On Russia's part, it must be remembered that France and Britain had invaded and humiliated Russia during the Crimean War of 1854, so taking a side opposite them must have come naturally. Amidst all this opportunism and calculation, we are also obliged to state that the Russia of that time took her role as protector of the Orthodox Christian faith seriously. This is the official reason the Russians gave in their media for supporting Ethiopia. Just know that multiple calculations were being made on all sides here. In 1893, after all this international back and forth, Menelik repudiated the Treaty of Uchale. The Italians responded by attacking and annexing small territories on the periphery of Ethiopian lands. In 1894, they crossed the Mareb River into the Tigray region, on the border with Eritrea. Italy expected the leaders of some of the territories under Ethiopian colonization, leaders who were unhappy with Ethiopian rule, to join the fighting on Italy's side. This did not happen to the extent Italy had hoped for. In a display of nationalism, anti-Italian feeling and xenophobia against Europeans encroaching into their lands, the ethnic Tigrayan and Amharic peoples sided with Ethiopia. There were, however, a few thousand black African troops called Askaris in the Italian army. The Italians were able to capture the Tigrayan capital of Adwa. The many victories by Italy over Ethiopia since the Battle of Degali gave the Italians some confidence. As the Italians were getting ready to enter Ethiopian territory, the Ethiopians engaged in a huge mobilization of men across the whole country. Menelik managed to mobilize about 190,000 men who rallied to the emperor at Addis Ababa. At this point, the Ethiopians approached the French for help. The request was not successful. In June 1895, Menelik sent a delegation to Russia to ask for help. This request was successful, and the Russians sent help of various kinds, including rifles. Before the Battle of Adwa, there were some small skirmishes that the Ethiopians won, including at Amba Alagi on the 7th of December 1895. 
According to some historians, even at this late stage, Menelik was hoping that there could be a negotiated resolution of the conflict. For an example, on the 18th of December, 1895, the Ethiopians defeated the Italians in another small engagement in Makele, but Menelik allowed the defeated Italians to retreat unmolested to the territory still occupied by other Italian brothers. He let them leave with their weapons and he provided the Italians with mules and other pack animals to help the Italians carry their supplies. He even provided the Italians with an escort of Ethiopian troops. Other historians, however, say that the escort Menelik provided to the retreating Italians was a ruse. According to this view, Menelik intended for the Ethiopian troops escorting the Italians to occupy the mountains next to Adwa, that is, next to the position occupied by the still undefeated Italian army. This brings us to the last and decisive battle of the entire podcast series, which is also the decisive battle of the First Italo-Ethiopian War, the Battle of Adwa, which took place on March 1896. For this battle, the Italian army consisted of approximately 18,000 men. The Ethiopian army had between 73,000 and 120,000 men. The Italians tried to attack very early in the morning, hoping to catch the Ethiopians while they were sleeping. However, the Ethiopians had woken up early for praying and holding a church service. Seeing the Italians approaching, the Ethiopians promptly attacked. The Ethiopians launched multiple waves of attack, until at last Menelik attacked with his last reserve of about 20,000 men, destroying an entire Italian brigade. Another brigade was destroyed by Menelik's horse-mounted troops. This left two Italian brigades, which were slowly destroyed during the course of the day. The remaining Italian survivors retreated and fled. Some historians say that the Ethiopians won because they had more soldiers. However, other scholars state that it wasn't that simple. In most African colonial wars of that era, the Europeans were seriously outnumbered including the aforementioned example of the final British victory over the Zulus in the early 1880s. While the Europeans almost always had much smaller numbers compared to the Africans, they won most of the time because of better arms and weaponry. Their soldiers were better trained and their strategies for the battle were more advanced. By the time of the African colonial wars, European countries had war colleges. They also had permanent general staffs who did nothing but plan for the wars and study the logistics of war. Simply put, war became a science in Europe after the Napoleonic Wars of the early 1800s. Thus, for Europeans, being outnumbered was never seen as a problem against Africans, especially as by this time the machine gun was used to reliably mow down thousands of Africans in battlefields from Cape to Cairo. This is why many historians praise the leadership of Menelik in the first Italo-Ethiopian war and the overall performance of the Ethiopians in the entirety of the conflict between Ethiopia and Italy in the 19th century. The aftermath of the Battle of Adwa wasn't at all like what had happened after the previous Italian defeats in this long struggle. After Adwa, Menelik went back to Addis Ababa. He was confident that he had given the Italians a mortal wound from a military point of view. However, and not to belittle the Ethiopians' military victories, probably the worst part of the defeat at Adwa for the Italians was that riots broke out in various Italian cities. The Italian people were tired of these foreign adventures which is somewhat amazing because the Italian people had previously been a big part of the reason the Italian government was gallivanting all over the world, looking for military glory. These riots in Italy were serious. The Italian government that was in power collapsed and was replaced. This made it easier for the new government to enter into a peace treaty with Ethiopia in October 1896, called the Treaty of Addis Ababa and the Italians were done practicing into duplicity when it came to treaties with Ethiopia. The long and short of this treaty is that it forced Italy to recognize the independence of Ethiopia. To confirm the Ethiopian victory on the international stage, British and French delegations arrived in Addis Ababa to make their own treaties with Ethiopia. 
basically to officially recognize Ethiopian borders and make sure that Ethiopia recognized the borders of their own colonies in the region. Somehow, five episodes later, it is all over. We hope we have made our small contribution in giving light to a story that is not very popular with ordinary people outside of Ethiopia. We hope you have enjoyed this series. Please join us for more African history stories on our future podcasts.